Thank you all for coming. Uh, the Duke Law Federalist Society and the program in public law are very pleased to have Robert Levy here to speak today. Mr. Levy is Senior Fellow in Constitutional Studies at Cato Institute and served as co-counsel for the plaintiff gun owners in last week's Supreme Court case, District of Columbia v. Heller. Mr. Levy has had a very distinguished career and sits on the boards of Cato, the Institute for Justice, and the Federalist Society. <clears throat> Mr. Levy has a PhD in business from American University, and his law degree is from George Mason. After law school, Mr. Levy clerked for Judge Royce C. Lamberth on the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C., and for Judge Douglas H. Ginsburg on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Mr. Levy, thank you for coming to speak with us today. It's great to be with you. Uh, I, I clerked for both uh, Judge Lamberth and Judge Ginsburg not too long ago because I went to law school pretty late in life. So as far as I know, I'm the only federal law clerk in history, as far as I know, who was older than the two judges that he... Uh, that he clerked for. So for, for two years in the, uh, in the courthouse in Washington, D.C., the marshals there, of course, guard that building with great uh, diligence. And they couldn't imagine that anybody my age was a law clerk. So for two years, it was always, good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Judge Levy. I never disabused them of that notion. <clears throat> so I was treated with great deference in the uh, halls of the building. It wasn't until I got up in the chambers that I did the usual clerk jobs of filling the water bottles, making sure the jury box was, uh, <clears throat> was presentable. Today's talk, uh, Second Amendment and gun control. Let me start with a common sense point of view, and that is that killers who are not deterred by laws against <clears throat> murder are certainly not going to be deterred by laws against uh, gun possession. The anti-gun regulations that we have in, in many of the major cities across this country really don't address the deep-rooted causes of violent crime. I'm talking about things like illegitimacy and, and unemployment and dysfunctional schools and drug abuse and alcohol abuse. Uh, the cures for those problems, of course, are complex and protracted, but it doesn't mean that in the interim, while we're awaiting those long-term cures, that we have to become passive prey uh, for the criminal predators. So on strictly policy grounds, uh, I think a compelling argument uh, can be made that Americans deserve an opportunity to defend themselves uh, by possessing suitable firearms, especially in their own home. Uh, but even, and I, I emphasize this because there's a law school audience, uh, even if the policy argument were to cut the other way, so even if it could be demonstrated, um, and it emphatically cannot be demonstrated, but even if it could, that more of these gun laws really do make us safer. And this de de debate is not just about policy. It's about the meaning of the Constitution, and of course, in particular, the meaning of the Second Amendment. And happily, on March 9th of, of 07, just about a year ago, the second most important court in the country, <clears throat> the uh, D.C. Circuit, ruled that the Constitution forecloses an outright ban on handguns like the one that they have in Washington, D.C. Now, what that means is that if we Americans decide, I, I think we would, if we did, we'd be doing so mistakenly, uh, that we really do need a handgun and a uh, ban in Washington, D.C. Or, or some other cities. Uh, the remedy is to change the Constitution. Uh, we, we can't uh, simply ignore the constitutional provision as though it did not exist. As a nation, we've chosen to have a written uh, Constitution. It's served us very well for more than two centuries. And so we're obliged to consider the constitutional question, not just the policy question. And this is a question that's divided Second Amendment scholars for decades, and it goes like this. Does the right to keep and bear arms belong to us as individuals, or does the <clears throat> Second Amendment merely recognize the collective right of the states to arm the members of their militia? And in 1939, the Supreme Court had a golden opportunity to resolve that, uh, that threshold question, the case <clears throat> that you may have studied in classes, United States v. Miller. And the challenge statute in Miller required registration of machine guns, sawed-off rifles, sawed-off shotguns, and, and silencers. But sadly, <clears throat> the court did very little to illuminate, and I think it's fair to say much to mystify, uh, the meaning of the Second Amendment. Uh, Justice uh, McReynolds, James Clark McReynolds, wrote the opinion, it was riddled with ambiguities and provided no definitive legal principle or no guidelines really for any modern um, Second Amendment uh, deliberation. <clears throat> the uh, facts of that case are kind of intriguing. I mean, when you think about 
This 1939 case, we're talking about 70 years ago, there hasn't been any Second Amendment litigation uh, reaching the Supreme Court in that 70-year period. So this is really an important case, and the facts are quite extraordinary. Uh, two mobsters, Jack Miller and Frank Layton, were indicted for knowingly transporting a sawed-off shotgun across state lines from Oklahoma to Arkansas. <clears throat> this was in violation of the 1934 National Firearms Act. That act required registration of such weapons and the payment of a substantial tax. So neither Miller nor Layton was charged with firing the gun or using the gun in the commission of the crime. They were charged with a technical violation of carrying the gun across state lines without um, registering the gun, without paying uh, the tax. And they won in the lower court. And the lower court ruled that this uh, National Firearms Act violated their Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Of course, the United States appealed, and it went up to the Supreme Court, and there things got pretty bizarre. Uh, Miller's attorney, a guy named Gutenson, he didn't even file a brief in the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, he didn't even show up. Uh, for our oral argument, and neither did his clients. Instead, Gutenson sent the Supreme Court a telegram, and this is what it said, and I quote from the telegram, suggested the case be submitted on the government's brief, unable to obtain any money from the clients to be present and argue the case. <clears throat> now, astonishingly, the court did nothing to appoint other counsel or even to delay uh, the, uh, the proceedings, reschedule the proceedings, and then Justice Mc McReynolds produced this muddled opinion that's confused lawyers and law students and judges and the publics for, for uh, the better part of 70, uh, 70 years. And when it was all over, the Supreme Court had reversed the trial court and said that the National Firearms Act did not violate the Second Amendment. And then they remanded the case for a new trial to find out whether the weapon involved, that is this sawed-off shotgun, uh, was the type of weapon that lent itself to militia effectiveness. No evidence had been introduced in that regard. But before the new trial could be conducted, Jack Miller was shot and killed. And Frank Layton uh, plea bargained and got uh, five years on, on probation. Of course, the damage to the Second Amendment had already been done. So here's this seminal Supreme Court case, and it was argued effectively by one party, the other party not represented, not even the, uh, an attorney present at the time the uh, court uh, deliberated the case. And so how do we interpret the Second Amendment? Well, correctly interpreted. Uh, the main clause, the operative clause, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, that defines and secures the right. There's no ambiguity in that text. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. No, normally we only look to the prefatory clause, the subordinate clause, when we need some guidance as to what the main clause means. Nonetheless, the prefatory clause has created a great deal of controversy over the years, and it is, of course, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. What's its purpose? Well, it helps explain why it is we have the right. It's one of the reasons we have the right, not the only reason, but it is one of the reasons. So membership in a well-regulated militia uh, would be a sufficient but not necessary uh, justification or condition to the exercise of your right to keep and bear arms. Imagine, for example, if the Second Amendment said this, and you'll hear that the syntax is is uh, almost identical. Suppose the Second Amendment said a well-educated electorate being necessary for self-governance in a free state, the right of the people to keep and read books uh, shall not be infringed. Now, would anybody argue as a result of that text uh, that only members of the well-educated electorate, that is, registered voters, uh, would have a right to read? Of course not. And yet that is precisely the implication when the Second Amendment is interpreted to apply only to members of the well-regulated uh, militia. If the uh, Second Amendment truly meant what the collective rights advocates proposed, and by collective I mean those who advocate, uh, that, who, <clears throat> who interpret the Second Amendment as if the right only applied in the context of, of militia service. If the Second Amendment truly meant that, the text would be a good deal more straightforward. It would say a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, uh, the right of the states to arm the members of their militia shall not be infringed. But the Second Amendment, of course, doesn't say that. It says the right of the people. And that's the same phrase that's used verbatim. It's a term of art in the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment. And the people are also mentioned in the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. That's five out of the top, uh, out of the Ten Amendments in the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> and, of course, the Bill of Rights is a section of the Constitution which is indisputably um, devoted to expressing the rights of individuals. Uh, not the powers of states. So there can't be any doubt that First Amendment rights, religion, speech, assembly, press, they belong to us as, uh, as individuals. Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches. 
Those are individual rights. In the context of the Second Amendment, we secure the right of the people by guaranteeing the right of each and every individual uh, person. As a matter of fact, not only weren't Second Amendments, and they, they were not intended, not only not intended uh, as a right of the state, they were intended as a protection against government, against the potential for a, a tyrannical government. Now, I think it's plausible to argue, I would agree with this, that the threat of tyrannical government is a good deal less today. Um, it's, not non, it's not zero, but it's a good deal less today than it was when our uh, republic was experiencing its uh, birth pangs. Uh, but government's inability to defend its citizens against both domestic and foreign predators remains a very serious problem. And the demand for police to defend us, it increases in proportion to our inability to defend ourselves. And that's why you will see disarmed societies that tend to become uh, police states, and you don't have to look very far to find that. Just look in downtown Washington, D.C., where I grew up, and you will see law-abiding inner-city residents who have been disarmed uh, by gun control, and they are begging for police protection, mostly against the, uh, the drug gangs, despite the terrible violations of civil liberties that often goes along with uh, this kind of police protection. And I'm talking about things like curfews and anti-loitering laws and civil asset forfeiture, and if you live in public housing, non-consensual searches of your home, and even video surveillance of residents in uh, in high crime areas in downtown D.C. So you can see that a disarmed citizenry, it creates the conditions that lead to excessive use of, of police power. And so in that sense, the right to bear arms is preventive because it reduces the demand for a police state. When the people aren't capable of protecting themselves, either they're going to become dependents of the state and the police apparatus uh, or they're going to become victims of the, uh, of the criminals. Um, what did Miller say? Well, predictably, the court's focus in Miller was on the prefatory clause, the troublesome clause, <clears throat> and McReynolds reasoned from that clause that the purpose of the Second Amendment was to ensure the effectiveness of the militia. But the unanimous holding in Miller uh, didn't hinge on whether or not Miller or Layton served in the militia. The court looked instead not to the people but to the weapon to the particular weapon that the defendants possessed, the sawed-off shotgun. So here's the crucial passage of the Miller opinion. <clears throat> in the absence, I quote, in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a sawed-off shotgun has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot, we, the Supreme Court, cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument so the focus is on the weapon. The obvious inference, by the way, is that military weapons would be covered. But if military use is the decisive test, then citizens could possess, in today's context, uh, shoulder-launched uh, missiles. And clearly, that is not what the court uh, had in mind. In fact, anti-gun advocates would be apoplectic if the court's military use doctrine were extended to cover weapons like the uh, improvised explosive devices in Iraq or maybe a, a rocket-propelled grenade for every Durham uh, uh, household. So a proper reading of the Second Amendment uh, shouldn't attempt to link each and every weapon to militia use, except to note that the grand scheme of the amendment uh, was to ensure that persons trained in the use of firearms uh, would be ready for militia service uh, when and if called. Now that is not, however, the manner in which the Miller opinion has been cited by trial and appellate courts in 10 out of 12 judicial circuits, all except <clears throat> the Fifth Circuit down in Texas, and the D.C. Circuit now. And the Fifth Circuit is an interesting case. It was United States v. Emerson, a 2001 case. The Fifth Circuit, of course, was bound by Miller, so it had to interpret Miller. And what the Fifth Circuit said was that Miller upheld neither the individual rights model of the Second Amendment nor the collective rights model of the Second Amendment. According to the Fifth Circuit, and I think the circuit was correct in this, and Miller simply looked at the weapon and decided that a sawed-off shotgun was not self-evidently protected. But then the Fifth Circuit went further and said, even though Miller didn't address individual versus collected, we on the Fifth Circuit are going to. And the Fifth Circuit concluded the Constitution, and I quote, protects the right of individuals, including those not then actually a member of any militia, to privately possess and bear their own firearms suitable as personal individual weapons. Now, the Fifth Circuit went on to say, 
that the right to keep and bear arms, which is declared to be an individual right, is not absolute. So killers, for example, don't have a constitutional right uh, to possess weapons of mass destruction. Quite clearly, some persons and some weapons can be restricted. And indeed, the court in the Emerson case went on to hold that Dr. Emerson's Second Amendment right, even though it was an individual right, not necessarily connected with militia service, his right could be temporarily curtailed because he was under a domestic violence restraining order and there was reason to believe that he might have posed a threat to his estranged wife. But if you put aside Emerson's personal situation, the Fifth Circuit back in 2001 was the only federal appellate court uh, trying to unravel uh, Miller's uh, tangled uh, logic that subscribed to the individual rights model uh, of the Second Amendment. All of the other 10 appellate courts uh, <clears throat> deny that there was an individual right. Now, there are a lot of legal scholars that are now agreeing with the Fifth Circuit, and of course with the D.C. Circuit in the recent case. And they're taking that same position that the Fifth Circuit took, namely, the Second Amendment secures an individual right, but it can be limited in some circumstances. And what's important about this is these are not just legal scholars on the right. These are liberals. These are legal scholars on the left. So here's how, uh, Harvard's uh, Alan Dershowitz, uh, from, former ACLU board member, and he says, and I quote, <clears throat> I hate guns, and I want the Second Amendment repealed. But then he goes on to say, I condemn foolish liberals who are trying to read the Second Amendment out of the Constitution by claiming it's not an individual right. They're courting disaster by encouraging others to use the same means to eliminate those portions of the Constitution that they don't like. And we also have Harvard's Lawrence Tribe uh, and Yale's uh, Akhil Lamar, uh, respected uh, constitutional scholars, tribe on everybody's shortlist, uh, every liberal's shortlist for the Supreme Court, <clears throat> and they say, they acknowledge there is an individual right under the Second Amendment, uh, albeit limited by reasonable regulation in the interest of public safety. So in that respect, a tribe and a, a mar, they agree with the Emerson Court, they agree with the D.C. Circuit on, on two fundamental issues. The first is the Second Amendment secures an individual right, not necessarily related uh, in the, uh, to service in the militia. And second, the right isn't absolute, it's subject to regulation. So to the extent that there's disagreement, it hinges on what constitutes permissible regulation, and that is uh, where to draw the line. And fortunately, help was on the way in Washington, D.C. D.C., at the time we filed the, what was called the Parker case, now called the Heller case, <clears throat> and I can tell you why that is later if we have time. <clears throat> D.C. was the only judicial circuit in 2003, this is more than five years ago we filed this case, uh, only judicial circuit that had not fleshed out its view of the Second Amendment. And so the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit had another opportunity to interpret uh, the Miller case. The case, as I say, originally was called Parker versus District of Columbia, a straightforward challenge to D.C.'s draconian uh, gun laws. It was filed by uh, two other attorneys and myself on behalf of six law-abiding D.C. residents who uh, want to possess functional firearms to do, defend themselves where they live and where they uh, sleep. So Parker was not and is not about um, machine guns or so-called assault weapons. Uh, it's about the right to own ordinary garden variety handguns. And the Parker plaintiffs didn't ask uh, for the right to carry a gun outside the home. That's something that's going to have to be litigated. It's an important question. It needs to be litigated, but it's not this case. It'll be litigated, more complicated case, for another day. Uh, the Parker litigation is about a pistol in the home uh, for self-defense. As you may know, off and on over the years, uh, Washington, D.C. has reclaimed its title as the nation's uh, murder capital. So the D.C. government has been totally ineffective, ineffective at disarming violent criminals. But what it has done a really superb job of is disarming decent and peaceable uh, residents in Washington, D.C. The laws are quite extraordinary. For starters, no handgun can be registered in D.C. To, no handgun. This is all people at all times in all homes for any purpose whatsoever. No handgun can be registered in Washington, D.C., unless you happen to be a police officer that works for the city. Now, if you happen to have a handgun in 1976, 32 years ago when this ban was first passed, you can keep the handgun. But the law says you can't carry it from room to room in your own home unless you have a permit 
And D.C. hasn't granted a permit in 32 years. Now, what about rifles and shotguns? Yep, you can have those in your home. But they have to be unloaded and either disassembled or trigger locked. So unless you're planning on clubbing somebody over the head with it, it's not likely to be very useful as a uh, firearm in, in uh, self-defense. Uh, so effectively, uh, no one in the district can possess a functional firearm in his or her own residence. And the law applies not just to unfit people uh, like uh, violent felons or, or children or, uh, or the mentally incompetent, but across the board to ordinary, honest, and responsible citizens. There have been more than three dozen challenges to the D.C. law um, under the Second Amendment. But they were filed by criminals. These are folks that have been convicted of felon in possession, or they've had sentence enhancements as a result of using a gun in the, in the, in the uh, commission of a crime. Um, and for obvious reasons, they didn't go very far. Uh, the Parker case was quite different. The lead plaintiff is a civil case, not a criminal case. The lead plaintiff was uh, Miss Shelley Parker. She lived in a high crime neighborhood in the heart of Washington, D.C. African American female people on her block were harassed relentlessly by the drug dealers and by the addicts, and she decided to do something about it. So she called the police time and again. That was futile. She encouraged her neighbors to do the same. She organized block meetings to discuss the uh, problem, and for her audacity, she was labeled as a troublemaker by the dealers, and they threatened her at every opportunity. In 2002, the year before we filed the case, the back window of her car was broken, and a large rock was thrown through her front window. Her security camera was stolen from the front of her house. A drug user actually drove his car into and through the back fence, and then in the year we filed the case, a dealer pounded on her door, tried to pry his way into her home. Uh, cursing and yelling, bitch, I'll kill you, I live on this block too. So he was charged with felony threat, and of course it was her word against his, he was acquitted. Uh, Shelley Parker knew that the police weren't going to do a whole lot about the drug problem uh, on her block, and she wanted a functional firearm in her <clears throat> home for self-defense, but she had feared arrest and prosecution because of D.C.'s unconstitutional uh, gun ban. Second plaintiff, uh, Mr. Heller, uh, was a special police officer and is a special police officer, private police officer. He carries a handgun all day long, and he provided security for the Thurgood Marshall Judicial Center, a federal office building in Washington, D.C. Uh, but when he applied for a position, uh, permission to possess his handgun, take it home to defend himself and his wife, he was turned down, as is everybody uh, in Washington, D.C. Another plaintiff included a gay colleague of mine at the Cato Institute who was assaulted by a group of young uh, homophobic thugs outside of D.C. yelling, faggot, queer, homo, we're going to kill you, they'll never find your body. Uh, he pulled a handgun out of his backpack and predictably his assailants weren't quite so brave. Of course, had he been in D.C., he couldn't have done that. So the six plaintiffs in, in, in the Parker case asked a federal judge to prevent D.C. from barring the registration of handguns altogether, from banning the possession of all functional firearms, including rifles and shotguns, uh, within the home and forbidding firearms from being carried from room to room uh, without a permit, which you can't get. Uh, the plaintiffs live in D.C., they pay their taxes there, they obey the laws there, but D.C. says if somebody breaks into their houses, uh, their only choice is to call 911 and, and pray that the police arrive in time. Now, if you've ever tried that in Washington, D.C., you will get Domino's Pizza before you will get 911. <clears throat> so that solution is not good enough. Uh, the right to keep and bear arms includes the right to defend your property and, of course, your family and your life. Now, why did we file a case in Washington, D.C.? Uh, well, for several reasons. D.C. was a unique and a, an appropriate venue. Uh, first, the city's rate of gun violence is among the highest in the nation. Uh, second, D.C. has, as I mentioned, the most restrictive gun laws of any uh, major city. Third, and these are two legal points, the third reason is, as you probably know if you've studied common law, until 1868, uh, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, the Bill of Rights was deemed to apply only to the federal government. Now, there's a series of cases, incorporation cases, beginning in 1897 that has, have, have had the effect of incorporating almost all of the Bill of Rights so that they now are applicable against state governments as well. This uh, issue of incorporation has never been resolved with, the sec uh, with respect to the uh, uh, Second Amendment. It will have to be litigated. That's a complex and, and, and widely debated question. We didn't want to have to deal with that. And by filing in D.C., we didn't have to deal with it because D.C. is a federal enclave, not a state, and Congress has plenary power in D.C., and so D.C. quite clearly is, is subject to, um, to uh, federal law. 
The fourth reason, and again, another interesting reason from a legal perspective, is that D.C. is where the federal government lives. And that's really important because what it means is D.C. is appropriate venue for any challenge on Second Amendment grounds under federal law to <clears throat> no matter where the infraction may have occurred. So if you think your gun rights were violated by some federal statute in Iowa, you can still, you don't have to sue in Iowa, you can sue, sue in Washington, D.C. because that's where the defendant lives. It's always proper venue. So if you win in D.C., you don't just affect cases arising under D.C. law, you affect all cases arising under federal law uh, as well. Now, as I mentioned, uh, in March of 07, um, the D.C. Circuit, Senior Judge Lawrence Silverman issued what I think is fairly characterized as a blockbuster opinion um, and held that, and I quote, the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. It's not limited to malicious service, nor is an individual's enjoyment of the right a contingent upon his or her continued or intermittent enrollment in the militia. So with that historic proclamation, uh, the D.C. Circuit became the very first federal appellate court in history uh, to overturn a gun regulation on Second Amendment grounds. I had mentioned that the Emerson Court in Texas, the Fifth Circuit, had found that there was an individual right, but the Emerson Court upheld the federal statute as a reasonable exception to that individual right. So D.C. was the first circuit to actually overturn a federal statute on Second Amendment grounds. Almost 70 years earlier, Miller had mistakenly concluded, in my view, that the Second Amendment's rights, they attach not to people, but they attach to specific uh, weapons. Now, does that mean that the Parker case and the Miller case can't be reconciled? It does not. The core holding of Miller, when you strip it of all the confusing clutter, was that a weapon uh, to be protected under the Second, Amend uh, Second Amendment must bear some reasonable relationship to the uh, preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. Parker is entirely compatible uh, with that holding because pistols, self-evidently, uh, bear a reasonable relationship to the efficiency of a militia. Pistols have been carried into battle uh, by American troops in every conflict since the Revolutionary War, and they specifically mentioned in the 1792 Militia Act as a, <clears throat> a weapon used by military forces. So for those of us who are eagerly uh, awaiting a comprehensive and indeed a comprehensible uh, Supreme Court statement on the Second Amendment that, that at a minimum de defogs or maybe even overturns uh, Miller, I think that it's fair to say the Constitution's on our side. Uh, that does not mean that D.C. will be unable to regulate firearms. Even Judge Silberman, in his opinion for the circuit, he conceded that the protections of the Second Amendment are subject to the same sort of reasonable restrictions that have been recognized as limiting, for example, the First Amendment. So if you read the First Amendment, it says Congress shall pass no law. What's that mean? It means we have laws restricting commercial speech, restricting campaign finance, advertising, restricting shouting fire in a clouded theater, incitement to riot, extortion, defamation, obscenity, et cetera, et cetera. So Congress shall pass no law that's not an absolute right. In the same sense, the Second Amendment is not an absolute right, and Judge Silberman recognized that among the things that might be permissible, he didn't have to reach this, but he said among the things that might be permissible uh, would be uh, concealed carry restrictions, registration requirements, proficiency testing, and certainly, and I don't think any reasonable person would dispute, keeping guns away from young kids and from <clears throat> uh, felons with a record of violent crime and from crazy people like the guy at uh, Virginia uh, Tech. But what they can't do in D.C. is implement an across-the-board ban uh, on all functional firearms in all homes for all residents. That isn't reasonable by any um, definition. And in fact, it's not even a regulation. It's an outright prohibition, and the Parker case said that that was unconstitutional. So that was the legal backdrop. Now, let me digress for a moment and give you some uh, of the practical things that you might be interested in since you're uh, all law students, sort of the anatomy of this case from a practical uh, perspective. Um, First question, why file a case in 2003? I mean, the Miller had been around since 1939, 60-some <clears throat> years. The uh, gun ban had been around since 1976, more than uh, uh, 30 years. So why, why did we file a case in 2003? Three triggering events precipitated the uh, litigation, um, <clears throat> two of which I'd mentioned. First was an outpouring of scholarship, most importantly from people on the left. 
uh, supporting an individual rights perspective of the Second Amendment. The second triggering event was, this, was the Fifth Circuit's holding in the Emerson case, which came in 2001. And third was the supportive position of the U.S. Justice Department. For the first time, the federal government went on record by filing a brief in the Emerson case and by an exhaustive memorandum prepared by the Office of Legal Counsel under Ashcroft favoring an individual rights interpretation. So those were the reasons we filed the case in 2003. Put that together, of course, with what I mentioned about D.C., high crime, horrible, um, horribly restrictive laws, uh, and no incorporation to deal with. What about plaintiffs? This is a public interest case. So the, 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 the not-so-nice thing about public interest law is that we, we attorneys don't get paid. Uh, the nice thing about public interest law is that we're not bound by the same, some of the same legal restrictions, professional responsibility instructions that govern for-profit uh, lawyers. So for-profit lawyers are not supposed to be instigating litigation. You're not supposed to take out a full-page ad in the New York Times saying you have a pet peeve and you want somebody to file a grievance. Well, we can do that as public interest lawyers. As a matter of fact, we do it all the time. Effectively, we can advertise uh, for plaintiffs. I suppose the reasoning is that we're not being paid and so there are no perverse incentives involved. Now, we didn't literally take out an adver advertisement, but we did much the same, uh, the equivalent of that, and that is we surveyed lots of different sources to, to, to find the appropriate plaintiffs. The other facet of public interest law, by the way, is that sometimes the cases are resolved not in a courtroom, but in the media, in the court of public opinion. If you want an example of that, take a look at the Kelo case. The Kelo case came down a couple of years ago, as you probably know, it held that you can take private property from a homeowner and turn it over to some other private developer who promises to increase the tax base and generate some more jobs. The Supreme Court, in an abominable opinion, said that that was perfectly okay. The Institute for Justice, which litigated the case, turned to the media. And as a result of that media uh, campaign, there had been a, an avalanche of, uh, of opposition among the public. And the result is 42 states now have passed state uh, legislation, which can always trump what the Supreme Court uh, provides in the way of protection, state legislation that have effectively has overridden the uh, Kelo uh, uh, decision. So we wanted plaintiffs who not only uh, had a good story to tell, but would be able to talk to the media. They would be art, art, articulate. So our, our um, criteria were, bearing in mind that we're talking not just about the courtroom, but the media, gender diversity, racial diversity, age diversity, economic uh, diversity. Obviously, they had to be uh, D.C. residents who fervently believed in gun owners' rights, who legitimately felt threatened where they lived. They felt at risk and they wanted to have a loaded weapon, not just spouting the words, but really wanted to have a loaded weapon in their home. And of course, they had to be law-abiding, responsible citizens with no uh, criminal, criminal background and articulate because they'd be dealing with the media. Result, dozens of plaintiffs that we uh, interviewed, six selected, three men, three women, um, ranging in age from the mid-20s to the early 60s. Uh, four were white, two African-American professions, ranged from a mortgage broker to uh, a communications lawyer to uh, a uh, courthouse security guard. And <clears throat> strategically, we decided to proceed incrementally, much the same way that Thurgood Marshall did, which had great uh, success in the, uh, in the civil rights uh, cases. So Parker was a straightforward constitutional challenge under the Second Amendment to D.C.'s gun laws. There were no statutory issues that, uh, implicated, and there were no other constitutional issues that might have distracted the court. It was very tempting for me particularly to, uh, to f include a Ninth Amendment right of self-defense, unenumerated right of self-defense, cause of action. We decided not to do so, not because we don't believe that that's a, a good argument, but rather because we didn't want <coughs> to divert attention from the Second Amendment. We wanted this to be a pure test of, of the... Uh, of the uh, uh, Second Amendment without anything that would distract the court. <clears throat> now, let me mention a, a, um, a little sidebar that you might be interested in, and that is some, uh, a companion case called Seegers uh, v. Ashcroft, later Seegers v. Gonzalez. This was sponsored by the NRA. So here's the background. We, uh, of course, I, I'm at the Cato Institute, and we've always been allied with the NRA on Second Amendment issues, even though not on some other <clears throat> issues, but uh, we told the NRA we're gonna, that I was going to file this case, and the NRA said, don't do it and because it's a really good case. You guys might win at the appellate court, and we're worried that we don't have the horses at the Supreme Court. Bad time. 
Well, for reasons I'll tell you about later, we didn't accept that advice. We went on and we, we did file the case. The NRA decided they didn't want inexperienced lawyers, uh, myself and my two colleagues, uh, handling this case. And so they decided, <clears throat> rather, even though they had advised us not to file the case, to get involved, and they filed a parallel case. The same court, same issues, five different plaintiffs. And then they filed that months after we did. And they moved to consolidate the two cases. It took us a half a year to resist that. And we finally won in the uh, lower court. The trial judge refused to consolidate the case. That was a blatant attempt for them to take control of the litigation. Well, as luck would have it, even though they filed the case months after we did, their case was assigned to a judge who happened to have a lighter docket or was more aggressive at pushing his docket than our judge. They actually got a decision before we did. And they went to the appellate court before we did. And they lost. Meanwhile, the appellate court put our case on hold because a decision in their case would necessarily dictate the outcome in our case, same issues. They lost in the appellate court, but it never reached the merits. They lost on standing grounds. All five of their plaintiffs were denied standing because they didn't have, it wasn't enough, it isn't enough in D.C. to say, i really like to have a gun and I, and I see that if I go get a gun, I'm breaking the law and I'm probably going to be prosecuted, so there's a chilling effect. In D.C., the crazy law of standing in D.C. effectively is you have to go out and break the law and be prosecuted before they deem that you have standing. So none of the NRA's five plaintiffs was judged to have standing, and their case was dismissed on standing grounds. And at that point, our case was allowed to go forward, even though we had filed months before their case. Our case did go forward. And five of our six plaintiffs were dismissed on standing grounds. One plaintiff, Mr. Heller, now you know why the case is called Heller and not Parker. One plaintiff, Mr. Heller, <clears throat> was allowed to go forward. Why did he have standing? because he is the only one that actually applied for a registration permit and was denied. And it was that denial, not the threat of prosecution, not the fact that he might go out and get an illegal gun and, and, and end up being prosecuted, but just the denial of his application, that was his injury. That was sufficient in D.C. to uh, establish standing. And so Mr. Heller was allowed to go forward, and of course we won in the appellate court. Now you might say, why were we so stupid and didn't have all six plaintiffs? Uh, go down and apply for registration. And why was the NRA even dumber than we were and not have any of their plaintiffs do so? Because in D.C. is catch-22. You can't apply for a, for a registration of an imaginary gun. You have to have a gun. You can't buy a gun in D.C. It's illegal. Well, why not go to Maryland and Virginia? Because federal law says you can't buy a handgun anywhere except the state where you reside. So you can't buy a handgun in D.C. You can't buy a handgun out of D.C. You can't apply for registration unless you have a handgun, and you can't get standing unless you apply for registration. That's a crazy law in Washington, D.C. So only Mr. Heller, who decades ago lived elsewhere and purchased the gun and then moved to D.C., couldn't bring the gun with him, but he could bring the paperwork, and so he could prove that he owned a gun, and he established standing. Now, we thought that was the end of the uh, situation, the, the loggerheads that we were at with the NRA. It was not to be. The NRA then, after losing their case, went to Congress and tried to get Congress to repeal the handgun ban. Ordinarily, that would be a good thing. <clears throat> but in this case, it would make our case moot because you cannot challenge a law that no longer exists. And of course, legislative repeal is nowhere near as good as a pronouncement from the Supreme Court. Legislative repeal would only have effect in Washington, D.C. Nowhere else, it wouldn't prevent bad cases from coming up to the court anyway. And, of course, legislative repeal could be reversed by the next Congress that felt uh, differently. We then had to spend many months lobbying to get the legislative actions tabled, and, in fact, we succeeded in doing that. And so, as you now know, the case went forward. I'm happy to say <clears throat> we now have a wonderful relationship with the NRA. They've done outstanding uh, work uh, on this case. They filed a terrific amicus brief. They've helped us line up other amicus support. And they are, when they want to be, they're an immense resource. And so I'm very grateful to them. But it is true that we had a long period of time during which it was really a, a, <clears throat> a difficult situation. Well, to make a long story short, in September, um, D.C. asked the Supreme Court to review the decision of the appellate court. Ordinarily, when you win in the appellate court like we did, you don't want the Supreme Court to review. Uh, but we wanted the Supreme Court to review, so did our clients, because that was their objective from the get-go. 
get a pronouncement from the Supreme Court about what the Second Amendment means, a pronouncement that would apply across the United States, uh, not just in Washington, D.C. We had oral argument on March 18th, uh, just about a week ago, <clears throat> and we should have a decision uh, this term by the end of uh, June. Now, I had mentioned that uh, we didn't take the NRA's advice. Just a very quick uh, comment as to why didn't we? Why didn't we agree with them that this was a bad time to seek Supreme Court review? Well, a couple of reasons. First, the court's makeup is better now than it has been in a long time. Uh, and secondly, it's better now than it's likely going to be. Now, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about generally about the court. I'm talking about from the perspective of somebody who's interested in the ruling on individual rights under the Second Amendment. From that perspective, I think the court is in better um, better uh, populated now than it has been or, or will be. Second, the other side has a lot more to lose than we do. As I mentioned to you, federal appeals courts, 10 out of 12 circuits. That's all the states, 47 states, all except Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, say that there's no Second Amendment recourse in federal court uh, if states uh, violate uh, your gun rights. Well, those decisions couldn't be any worse. So they're not going to be effective. Even if the Supreme Court goes the wrong way in D.C., those state laws are still on the books, and they will stay on the books. The flip side of that coin is that there are 44 states under state law, either state statutes or state constitutional provisions, that do protect an individual right to keep and bear arms. None of those laws rests on the Second Amendment. And so, therefore, a ruling on the Second Amendment should not affect those state laws, which will remain uh, in effect. Um, Another reason is that a bad case would ultimately go up if a good case didn't. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, public defenders across the country that are challenging Second Amendment uh, criminal convictions, challenging criminal convictions on, on Second Amendment grounds. And sooner or later, you're going to get an anti-gun court. And all it takes is four for certiorari, as you know. And they will reach down and grab one of these cases, and you'll end up with a murderer or a crackhead as the poster boy uh, for your Second Amendment challenge. And then finally, we had the Justice Department that had filed and indicated that they supported uh, a, a uh, individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment. So for all those reasons, uh, we thought that the time was right, even though the NRA thought otherwise. Um, our hope is and our expectation is that the court, even uh, the more liberal justices, are going to be persuaded on this threshold question about the individual versus collective rights issue. They're going to be persuaded by the text of the amendment, by the history, the purpose, the structure of the Constitution, by the intent uh, of the framers, and even by empirical studying, studies showing quite clearly that gun control doesn't work. The enactment of these anti-gun regulations has really become an article of, of, of faith. The regulations persist, and they even spread, uh, despite lots of data showing uh, that they should be uh, repealed, and that we will be safer, indeed, if they are repealed. Well, happily, after 32 years under the D.C. gun ban, uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals <clears throat> told the D.C. government it can't ignore Second Amendment rights, and we are hopeful that the Supreme Court will see it the same way. Um, if you're interested in all of the data filings, and there, it's enormous. There's 67 amicus briefs, 67, 47 of them on our side, 20 on the side of the district. They are all posted on our website, www.dcguncase, all one word, <clears throat> .com. And that, by the way, that website um, turns out to be probably the, the best repository of Second Amendment scholarship uh, that exists anywhere, on, on, including things on both sides of this argument, all of the amicus briefs there. And it's an immense outpouring of, of Second Amendment scholarship covering both uh, the pro-individual the pro, uh, uh, rights view and the opponent's view as well. Thanks very much. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, sir. What became of the uh, Solicitor General here? Uh, can you explain that? Uh, I've not read his brief, but I read about his brief. Well, this is the worst development that occurred in the entire five years of uh, litigating this case. We had expected, uh, because the Ashcroft Justice Department had filed this uh, supporting brief in the Emerson case and uh, in this exhaustive legal opinion, we had expected support from the current Justice Department under Attorney General McKay and Solicitor General Paul Clement, uh, particularly since Paul Clement is known to be not only a very bright guy, uh, but also a, a very conservative guy who almost certainly believes in an individual right. 
Well, he filed a brief that uh, was frankly a disaster. It said, yes, there is an individual right, and yes, the court should scrutinize any regulations, not under strict scrutiny, which we had argued for, but under some heightened level of scrutiny, something beyond the rubber stamp that always uh, that exists on rational basis scrutiny. But then he went on to say, if the court establishes this heightened level of scrutiny, the court then needs to send the case back to the lower courts to determine whether the D.C. gun ban passes muster. Now, frankly, if the D.C. gun ban, which is a ban on all functional firearms for everybody at all times and all places, if that passes muster, you cannot imagine any regulation that the court would invalidate. So this is craziness. And um, not only is it craziness, but it would be the death knell for the litigation. It would mean many, many more years of depositions, of a battle of the expert witnesses, of statisticians. I'm pretty sensitive to this since I'm paying the costs. <clears throat> so it matters to me that this go back to the uh, trial court. And then to return to an appellate court or Supreme Court whose complexion has changed materially over the years, and who knows what would happen. So we uh, were most uh, upset about that. I am happy to say that the NRA, again, in indicating how great a resource they can be, uh, went to Congress, and some of you may have read about this, and they got an amicus brief signed by 250 members of the House of Representatives, including 68 Democrats, 55 members of the Senate, including nine Democrats, and Vice President Cheney, not as in his capacity as Vice President, but in his capacity as President of the Senate, indicating quite clearly that he disagreed with his own Justice Department about <clears throat> what should happen to this case. Uh, that's something the NRA is very good at, particularly in an election year. And that was a wonderful brief, one of the briefs that's posted on our uh, website. Yes, sir. Um, I actually have two questions. First of all, on the textualist argument, how do you, you seem to describe it as a, um, the militia term to be a separate clause from the rest of the amendment. How do you deal with the argument that if that were true, it would be a semicolon? Of like a comma in between, and that like well, you know, th these arguments about the punctuation in the militia clause uh, uh, and the rest of the amendment, they've been going on <clears throat> for a couple hundred years. And frankly, the, the, not even the other side is making that case that uh, that you can put much weight in the punctuation. Nobody understands why that comma appears. Uh, so I've heard all kinds of crazy theories, but it's not even argued in the briefs uh, by the city or by any of its amici that that makes any difference uh, whatsoever. So while I am uh, a textualist and while I do think the text supports our view of the amendment, I don't think that punctuation uh, makes a heck of a lot of difference any more than the capitalization of certain words do. If you look through the Constitution, you can't figure out why certain words are capitalized and others are not uh, capitalized. And my second question is, um, in a situation where you're dealing with something that has been such a long history, how do you impress upon the justices a pragmatic point of view of what the effects will be on the ground afterwards? Well, you know, this is the, the policy question. And uh, while I said at the outset that policy and law um, have their separate realms, there is a case uh, in it, uh, where policy and law intersect. And that is, once a court has established appropriate level of scrutiny, then the court has to engage in this process by which they determine if that scrutiny has been met. So if, for example, the court decides on strict scrutiny, that is government in order to justify its regulation has to show there's a compelling need and that its regulations are narrowly tailored, they're not overbroad, they don't sweep any further than is necessary, and there's just some real benefit that these regulations are going to be effective, that's when they have to look at the policy question. They have to find out whether or not the regulations have worked, whether the regulations do uh, curtail more activity than is necessary to accomplish their stated ends. Uh, so I, I do think that pragmatic part of this has to be impressed upon the justice. Well, it doesn't have to be impressed upon them because I'm sure they're uh, aware of this, but that is the intersection of uh, policy and, and constitutional law. But I emphasize that that doesn't take place until they have decided on a standard of review. And you will have a different interpretation of policy data depending upon whether you have rubber, rubber stamp rational basis scrutiny or you have strict scrutiny or you have something uh, in between in the back. Could you cut the differences between uh, the Department of Justice's position and Vice President Cheney's position? Vice President Cheney's position was, again, if, if uh, I can ascribe to the Vice President everything that was in the brief that he signed, his position was not only is there an individual right, 
but that right should be subject to strict scrutiny, not just heightened scrutiny, and there is absolutely no remand, no need for a remand. There's no more fact-finding necessary to determine under any standard, much less under the one that he would recommend, strict scrutiny, whether an outright ban on all functional firearms could possibly uh, withstand uh, uh, judicial uh, review. Yes? Uh, assuming the Supreme Court does find a personal right, what do you think the next step will be that either the KO Institute or the NRA will pursue in order to flesh out that right? Uh, would it be to, to see, is it incorporated by the 14th Amendment? Um, first, is it won't be the Cato Institute. The Cato Institute is not involved in this litigation. The Cato Institute is a think tank. They don't, they don't litigate. They do file amicus briefs. They do support the case. They have filed an amicus brief in this, in this case. So it, it may be the NRA or it may be some other um, lawyers who decide to do this. There will be two strands of litigation that have to follow. Uh, the first will be this test of incorporation. So as I mentioned, incorporation is not an issue in D.C. The court could resolve that, but I doubt that they will because they don't have to reach that issue in this case. And they rarely reach issues that they don't have to. Although there's a column today by Michael Dorff at Columbia, he claims that they do have to reach uh, the issue. Otherwise, you're left in the situation where something might apply to D.C. and not, and not to the states, and that would be inconceivable. Um, I think he's right about it being inconceivable, but I don't think it means that they all have to be resolved, all, that both of those issues have to be resolved at the same time. So they could resolve the issue about D.C. and then later resolve the issue about incorporation. I do agree with them that it's inconceivable if they decide that the D.C. gun ban is unconstitutional, that this is not going to be incorporated. And why should the Second Amendment be different than any other part of the Bill of Rights, almost all of which has been incorporated, except for the right to the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial uh, when... 20 bucks is at stake. Um, and, and maybe there hasn't, I don't know if there's been some incorporation on the Third Amendment quartering of soldiers, but um, all the amendments that really matter to us, they've been incorporated. The Second Amendment is a fundamental right defined, as you probably know, as implicit in the concept of order liberty or deeply rooted in the traditions um, and culture of our country. So there's no question but the right to keep and bear arms, the right of self-defense is one of those fundamental rights I can't imagine wouldn't be incorporated. The second strand will be fleshing out this issue of the intersection of policy and law, which regulations will be permitted under whatever standard it is that the court um, adopts. Yes, sir, in the green shirt. I wonder if you could uh, answer the question that Justice Stevens posed in oral argument that your men uh, kind of avoided, which was simply uh, what, what would your position be on a, a state school, state university banning weapons in the door? All that pain. Well, my position is that, um, <clears throat> you know, the justices at oral argument, they hate to hear the phrase, this is not that case. You know, they ask a question, they want an answer. So it's not enough for us to say, hey, we're not dealing with that here. But the answer is we're not dealing with that here. Um, our case is about handguns in the home for self-defense. It's not about protection. Uh, or lack thereof on the campuses of Virginia Tech and other schools. Now that said, I think the outcome of that, uh, the resolution of that question will hinge on the standard of scrutiny that the court adopts. If they adopt strict, strict scrutiny, I think it's, it's a, a close call as to whether or not a campus could justify keeping handguns away from people who have already passed the necessary requirements to have concealed carry permits. These are not just somebody who happens to bring a gun on a campus. This is somebody who can carry a gun anywhere in the state. But there is this one exception, you know, the campuses of a public university. They've already met the proficiency requirements. They've already passed the background trip. They've already it's been certified that they uh, don't have anything in their background that would disqualify them from having a gun, and yet they can't have a gun on the campus. So if there's strict scrutiny, it seems to me that a regulation like that might uh, be set aside. If there's some level less than strict scrutiny, my guess is that kind of regulation is going to pass muster. And I don't pretend to know enough about um, that policy issue to tell you what my view is on a policy basis as to whether it should pass muster or it shouldn't. I mean, it does suggest to me that when somebody kills 32 people on the Virginia Tech campus and it takes him a couple hours to do it and he reloads his gun 10 to 15 times and nobody does anything about it because nobody possesses weapons whereby they could do something about it. That, it seems to me, is a problem. And there are lots of other campuses that don't have these kinds of restrictions, and they haven't turned into Dodge City. 
We haven't seen the campus quadrangles turn to a river of blood. Uh, but we did see that in a number of campuses where people are prevented from defending themselves and stopping this kind of uh, slaughter. Yes? Um, how was Alan Burr chosen? I mean, this whole case was manufactured, or more or less manufactured, and someone that's never argued before the Supreme Court was chosen to do oral arguments for such an important case. He did a great job. But I'm just curious, how was he chosen? He was chosen by me and by uh, Clark Neely, who's a, a lawyer for the Institute for Justice that some of you may know because I'm sure he's been here to speak to you as well. Uh, Clark and I clerked together, and uh, I'm on the board of the Institute for Justice, and we've been good friends. And, and when we thought about this case, he couldn't do it because he's busy with the Institute. I couldn't do it because I'm too old. And, uh, and so we thought about finding somebody who uh, might do a good job. Alan uh, was willing to work for subsistence wages. And part of the deal was that I struck with him. He would be paid a good deal less than he's worth. But if the case turned out to be a case that would go up, it would be his. And uh, we were under um, enormous pressure. I can't tell you what kind of uh, enormous pressure it was to hire the folks whose names I'm sure you're all familiar with. You know, why didn't we hire uh, Ken Starr or, or, or uh, Ted Olson or one of the other Supreme Court superstars? Well, if you read the transcript of the oral argument, you'll see D.C. had a Supreme Court superstar, Walter Dellinger, who's the former Solicitor General, a very, very capable lawyer. And there is something to be said for having somebody up there before the Supreme Court that has a good deal of experience. There's also something to be said for having somebody up there who for five years has been immersed in the issue and knows every nook and cranny. And that was Allen. And he did do, I think, a superb job. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier that as a part of the strategy, you declined to address the um, right of self-defense as a constitutional issue because you wanted to focus on the Second Amendment. Um, however, in this case, a lot of people have argued that as a basic matter, the right to bear arms is still upheld because you could have a shotgun and rifle, and um, even the plaintiffs conceded that the government has a certain right to regulate. So it seems as if the, like, the actual issue being litigated is whether or not it is a right to self-defense and the, the ability of a handgun to provide that right to self-defense. So at that point, is the question really answered in Second Amendment litigation, or, or do we instead need to focus on the separate question which was left well, out? Uh, I'm sorry if I said that I, I, we decided not to include a right of self-defense. I, <clears throat> I misspoke if I said that. What I meant was that we decided not to include a Ninth Amendment cause of action which would uh, represent the unenumerated right to self-defense, which is quite different than saying we decided against arguing for a right to self-defense. So we did argue uh, emphatically that there is a right to self-defense, but that is codified in the Second Amendment. The Militia Clause of the Second Amendment is one purpose for the exercise of the right to keep and bear arms, but not the exclusive purpose for that right. So our argument was a, a, an alternative one, namely, under Miller, we win. Because Miller says you look to the weapon. If the weapon is the type of weapon that lends itself to a more effective militia uh, and is in common use for lawful civilian purposes, those were the two criteria in Miller, uh, then it's, it's, it's a protected weapon. Handguns, self-evidently, are part of an efficient militia. They are in common use. They're used, by the way, of 40% of all guns in the country are handguns. 70% of all self-defense um, incidents are, are with a... Uh, a handgun, so there's no doubt that they are, do have militia effectiveness in their common use. So under Miller, we win. But by the way, in the alternative, militia use is not the only purpose for which the Second Amendment exists. It also codifies a right to hunt, for example, and a right of self-defense. Bear in mind that the Second Amendment did not create a right to keep and bear arms. What it says in the text, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The right, meaning that the right existed. It pre-existed the Second Amendment, pre-existed the Constitution pre-existed the U.S. government, obviously pre-existed any militia, and so it couldn't be contingent on its exercise, uh, contingent on the existence of a, of a militia. Now, we, I was tempted to also argue that even if we fail on all of those Second Amendment arguments, there is, after all, an unenumerated right to self-defense that is part of the Ninth Amendment, and I was persuaded uh, not to include that cause of action. In retrospect, I'm glad we didn't, uh, because we did want this focus of the court exclusively on the Second Amendment. 
after 70 years, it would about time to get a, an opinion from the court that indicated what the Second Amendment meant. Yes, sir. Um, after the extensive research y'all have done and the oral arguments, what's your best guess on how many justices you think might actually endorse an individual uh, right? Well, <clears throat> first, um, these things are highly unpredictable. I've been in oral arguments before to court, and uh, it looks like the questioning's all gone in one direction, and the opinion comes out, and it's completely the opposite. Uh, when we went to the U.S. Court of Appeals, I was asked for a prediction, and I said, well, I'm not sure about Griffith, because he's a new guy, and, and, uh, and Judge Silverman is known to be a, a wild card at times, so unpredictable, but I was sure we had Henderson, who was a reliable Carolina conservative, right? Well, she was the only one that dissented. And, uh, and Silverman and Griffith were on our side. So, so much for my powers of, uh, of prediction. That said, um, based on what I observed at the oral argument, the most encouraging thing was that Justice Kennedy, who everybody's shooting for as a swing vote, uh, made declarative statements, quite separate and apart from his questioning, declarative statements that indicates that he stood on the side of an individual right. So I wouldn't be surprised if we get, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not over-optimistic, a, a supermajority that favors that threshold question, that there's an individual right, not a collective right, either 6-3 or 7-2. Um, but we could win that battle and lose the war, because the next question is, does the D.C. gun ban pass muster? Is it constitutional? And if the Justice Department's idea about sending this back to the lower courts uh, prevails, or if the court uh, says that the D.C. gun ban is, is constitutional, then e even though there's an individual right, uh, because it's a reasonable regulation, uh, then I will count that as a loss, even though we win on the individual right uh, question. And of course, that question, which what, what regulation is permissible and is the D.C. gun ban constitutional, that's a much closer call, and uh, we won't have the kind of supermajority on that issue uh, that we would have on the individual rights question. I'd be very happy with 5-4, of course, as long as it goes the right way. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate your time.